All right, so the next chapter in the book uh, is called RNA Metabolism because it's uh, just about how RNA is made and how it's used. But really, what it's about is transcription. And transcription is important because it is the first step in gene expression. And the process of gene expression is so universal and so important that the uh, the basic process is referred to as the central dogma of biology. The simple idea that every protein is made through a process called translation by taking a, a messenger RNA molecule uh, as a template and then uh, which in turn is made from a DNA template and that DNA is the gene. So uh, in a sense um, central dogma is pretty simple uh, and you can so the central dogma can be summarized pretty simply uh, DNA again is what genes are made of so this is a double-stranded DNA molecule Not drawing very well. I can do better than that. Here's a double stranded DNA molecule. Uh, somewhere within this region, let's say here to here, is a gene. At a certain point in time in a cell, a process called transcription. Which we're going to talk about in a second will result in the production of a molecule of mRNA which is not that big messenger RNA that is the product of transcription and then that messenger RNA will be used to produce a protein which of course as we know is a sequence of amino acids and that process which we'll talk about um, in the next chapter actually is called translation so again this is the central dogma which you probably are already familiar with, but just in case you're not, um, it's again very fundamental to everything about biology. The same exact process, more or less, with uh, different components, different proteins involved, happens in every organism, um, from bacteria to humans. And uh, so again, when I say it's universal, that's what I mean. And there are lots of different ways of describing this, lots of different models we could use to try to simplify it personally. Uh, so for example, this little diagram here uh, tries to simplify it for you. You have here genes uh, as part of chromosomes. Those chromosomes get translated into messenger RNA. There's some processing that goes on, which we'll talk about later. That gets exported to the cytoplasm. And then uh, translation occurs um, in the cytoplasm where proteins get made. But uh, to make it even simpler than that, I like to use what I call the SpongeBob SquarePants model of gene expression. So let's say you are the proprietor of the Krusty Krab and someone orders your signature dish, the Krabby Patty. Now, your problem is that your uh, you want to make sure that your recipe for the Krabby Patty does not get stolen by uh, the evil plankton. So you keep your recipe book in a safe and so whenever someone orders a Krabby Patty you go to your safe, you get out your recipe book and you don't take the recipe out, you don't take the book out, you just make a copy of it on a piece of scrap paper um, and you give that scrap paper to your fry cook and of course you have to do this every time because your fry cook is not very smart. He forgets the recipe every time. Uh, but once you've, uh, once he gets the recipe, he then uses it to make a Krabby Patty. 
the reason this is a good metaphor for gene expression is because uh, a gene is essentially a recipe for making a protein. And you can think of a chromosome as a recipe book. And so uh, just like recipes make up a cookbook, genes make up a chromosome. And so the copy of the, G of the recipe that you write on your scrap paper is like a molecule of messenger RNA, which is a, essentially a copy of the recipe. Um, and so the process of making that copy is called transcription, which we will we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then SpongeBob is our ribosome. He is the, uh, the ribosome is the complex of proteins and mRNA or proteins and ribosomal RNA, which will be responsible for making our protein. Um, that process is called translation. Um, and again, the protein is usually the final product. Now there are other other functions for RNA. There's a lot more steps involved. Uh, it, get more, it gets more complicated, but um, it's just an easy way to remember the relationship between DNA, RNA, and protein. Um, so let's talk about transcription, because again, that is the first step of this process. So transcription is simply making a messenger RNA, or actually it doesn't have to be messenger RNA, all RNA molecules, whether they're used to uh, make proteins or not, get made the same way. But an enzyme called RNA polymerase moves along the DNA uh, within the region of the gene. It unwinds the DNA as it goes, and it reads one of the strands, and only one strand, and makes a molecule of mRNA, which is complementary to that template strand. And it keeps going until it gets to the end of the gene, and then it lets go. And then the RNA uh, is free to be translated by uh, ribosome. Um, so again, this is just the basic process. This is more or less what it looks like. Um, some important bits of terminology. Uh, again, transcription only occurs on one strand. That's an important difference between transcription and DNA replication. So with replication, you're copying both strands. With transcription, only one strand acts as the template strand, and the other one is the non-template strand. Uh, and so here you can see the uh, this strand down here is the template strand, and this strand up here is the non-template. Um, also, another uh, similarity between transcription and replication is that RNA polymerase always adds uh, new nucleotides to the three prime end. So just like uh, DNA polymerase, RNA polymerase reads up, meaning it reads from three prime to five prime. So with respect to that template strand, it's moving three prime to five prime and it writes down, meaning it creates the new strand in the five prime to three prime direction. Um, so we call the, the strand that is the, that RNA polymerase is actually reading uh, the DNA uh, template strand and the other one, the non-template strand. However, because the RNA transcript is going to be complementary to the template strand, by definition, because uh, with the except, I mean, well, it's complementary in the sense that uh, it will hydrogen bond uh, or form uh, DNA RNA hybrid with the template strand. But because it's complementary to the template strand and the non template strand is also complementary to the template strand, the non template strand and the RNA transcript, the, the version of the RNA that's uh, the RNA that's made from the template, will have the same sequence, um, with the exception of uracils in the place of uh, thymines, because uracil is found in RNA and thymidine is found in DNA. So sometimes uh, the non-template strand is referred to as the coding strand, and that's because it has the same base sequence as the RNA transcript, uh, again, replacing T's with U's. So for any given gene, one strand is always the template strand, and the other strand is always the, co the non-template or coding strand. Sometimes the template strand is also called the non-coding strand. And so that's true for that gene no matter what. Um, 
but for any given chromosome, either uh, strand can be the template or the non-template strand, depending on the gene. So for example, here we have three different genes uh, all on one chromosome, one DNA, double-stranded DNA. Uh, gene one, this top strand is the template strand. Uh, gene two, the bottom strand is the template strand. Gene three, uh, it's back to the top strand again. So either strand can be the template strand, uh, but for any given gene, only one is going to be the template strand. Uh, so the enzyme that actually carries this out is called RNA polymerase. So it's called RNA polymerase, uh, just like DNA is called DNA polymerase. It polymerizes RNA. It adds new uh, ribonucleotide triphosphates to the end of an existing uh, RNA strand, to the three prime end, and so uh, enzymatically it works a lot like DNA polymerase. It has an active site that looks pretty similar. Um, it, it has to stabilize all those negative charges, so it has some magnesium ions, uh, and it will only let uh, an incoming nucleotide triphosphate be attached to the three prime end if the base is complementary to the base on the template strand. So at this position, for example, uh, the enzyme will only add this adenine to the three prime end of this growing strand because it is complementary to this T. If another base were here, if this was a, a guanine, for example, it wouldn't base pair stably with that thymidine and the enzyme would not add it on. Uh, transcription has uh, basically three stages, kind of like DNA uh, replication. Uh, initiation is the beginning of transcription. Uh, this is the most important step actually because uh, not every gene is expressed in every cell all the time. So some genes are only used in some cells, like some genes are only important for neurons and they're only expressed in neurons. Some genes or some proteins, for example, may only be expressed at certain times during development or when uh, certain environmental factors have been triggered. So every gene has a DNA sequence that is found uh, at the three prime end uh, of the gene before the coding part of the gene, uh, which is called a promoter. And the promoter is essentially like a little flag or a signpost that tells the proteins that are responsible for initiation to start here. So these promoters and other uh, uh, nearby sequences uh, are how the proteins involved in initiation know where transcription should occur. And so every gene has its own unique promoter, uh, which is important because again, otherwise you would have every gene being expressed in every cell all the time. And so the presence of certain proteins called transcription factors are what, uh, and those transcription factors bind to these promoters and uh, help recruit the RNA polymerase complex because of course RNA polymerase like DNA polymerase is not just one protein, it's a complex of multiple proteins. But the assembly of those proteins requires these transcription factors and the transcription factors require these promoter sequences. Now again every gene has its own unique promoter but there are some similarities between promoters uh, especially within species. Uh, and so there are some sequences called consensus sequences that are found uh, uh, very frequently. So in prokaryotes, like bacteria, for example, um, most prokaryote genes have these regions that are 10 base pairs and 35 base pairs upstream from the, the transcription start site. So we call it the minus 10 and minus, th minus 35 region. And you can see if you compare those regions in different genes, there's uh, some bases that are that are common at that position for all these genes. Uh, in eukaryotes, uh, most eukaryote promoters have a region uh, about 30 base pairs upstream from the uh, transcription start site that usually have this sequence somewhere inside TATA. -ta. So sometimes uh, this is called the TATA -ta box, um, and that's always that's going to be a part of most eukaryote promoters. Uh, elongation is just the is the second stage and it's basically just the process of actually making the messenger RNA. So uh, once all the RNA polymerase enzyme is assembled and all the transcription factors are recruited, the enzyme starts making a, uh, a messenger RNA 
from the template strand or the, temp the template DNA strand and using nucleotide triphosphates to assemble it. Uh, RNA polymerase, unlike DNA polymerase, does not require a, prim a primer. So in other words, it doesn't need an existing three prime in to add a base to. So it can just start from the transcription start site. Also, because it's only copying one strand, it does have to unwind the DNA, but it rewinds the DNA as it goes along. So you don't need, for example, uh, a helicase or uh, any other uh, DNA uh, enzymes in order to modify the double helix. Um, and, and typically once the enzyme passes through a given region of DNA, the DNA rewinds and essentially goes back to the way it was. And then termination of transcription is just the end of transcription. So it's when the RNA polymerase reaches the end of the gene and stops transcription. So again, with DNA replication for RNA polymerase, it stops when it copies the entire chromosome. But with transcription, you don't want to make a transcript of the entire chromosome. You only want to transcribe the gene. So there has to be some sort of signal, some sort of uh, DNA sequence that tells RNA polymerase that it's reached the end of the gene and to let go. Um, there are different kinds of termination mechanisms. This is just an example um, that does not require any other proteins to help out. So uh, many uh, genes have this sequence where you have a long stretch of, of uh, T's at, on the template strand. And what happens is when the RNA polymerase starts copying or transcribing those T's, um, they, uh, or they, I mean, they're transcribing the A's, they put a bunch of U's uh, across from that A. And uh, the reason that's important is because um, that sequence is able to form a hairpin loop. And the hairpin loop actually triggers the, um, the actually what happens is the, because there's a long stretch of these A's, uh, the AU base pairing can slip. So uh, these bases can kind of slip and slide past each other, which forms an unstable complex. And it basically makes the uh, the polymerase pause. Actually what it does is it pauses and tries to back up, but because this hairpin loop is present, it's not able to uh, back up. And so since it can't go forward and it can't go backwards, it just quits. It just gives up, lets go of the mRNA, and that's the end of transcription. Um, so that works for some genes. Other genes have proteins that recognize certain sequences either on the DNA or on the RNA. This is called row-dependent termination because it requires this protein called row helicase. And row helicase recognizes a certain sequence uh, on the mRNA. And once it binds there, it starts moving toward the 3' end of the mRNA. And when it gets there, it, it sort of disassembles the RNA polymerase from the DNA, and that stops uh, transcription. Uh, again, here's a video from HHMI. Uh, that kind of shows this in better detail. Central dogma of molecular biology, DNA makes RNA makes protein. Here the process begins. Transcription factors assemble at a specific promoter region along the DNA. The length of DNA following the promoter is a gene, and it contains the recipe for a protein. A mediator protein complex arrives carrying the enzyme RNA polymerase. It maneuvers the RNA polymerase into place, inserting it with the help of other factors between the strands of the DNA double helix. The assembled collection of all these factors is referred to as the transcription initiation complex, and now it is ready to be activated. The initiation complex requires contact with activator. ...proteins, which bind to specific sequences of DNA known as enhancer regions. These regions may be thousands of base pairs distant from the start of the gene. Contact between the activator proteins and the initiation complex releases the copying mechanism. 
The RNA polymerase unzips a small portion of the DNA helix, exposing the bases on each strand. Only one of the strands is copied. It acts as a template for the synthesis of an RNA molecule, which is assembled one subunit at a time by matching the DNA letter code on the template strand. The subunits can be seen here entering the enzyme through its intake hole, and they are joined together to form the long messenger RNA chain snaking out of the top. So, um, next time we will talk about some of the processing steps that happen in eukaryotes uh, after transcription is over.